Chapter 18, Kiana Rubini. Top four reasons why my half-brother Chauncey is like Vladimir. One, the smell. Dirty diapers and baby puke. Enough said. Vladimir's terrarium after the weekend is no perfume factory either. Two, the noise. Chauncey's howling has the edge in volume, but Vladimir's high-pitched squeaks are even more piercing. It goes without saying that both of them are spoiled by too much attention. That's stepmother's fault in Chauncey's case. For Vladimir, it's Miss Fountain's seventh graders and, lately, us. When he wants somebody to feed him a dead cricket, which is all the time, the cheeping and chirping are at a frequency that feel like a miniature blender at the center of your brain. Three, the teeth. They both have zero. Okay, Vladimir probably has more than that, but you don't know they're, they're there until he nips you. And to be fair, Chauncey does have a couple of chompers breaking through, bottom front. It's pretty cute, actually. Four, the time suck. That's the biggest similarity between them. Dealing with Chauncey is 25-hour-a-day job, mostly for Step Monster, but also for Dad and me. If you leave him alone for 10 seconds, he'll find a way to stick his drool-covered finger into an electric outlet, light himself on fire, and roll down at least one flight of stairs. Vladimir is every bit as impossible to ignore. When he starts squeaking, you go running. And he's not satisfied with just anybody. These days, the attention he craves is from Aldo. Leave it to Vladimir to love the least lovable person in the whole school, except maybe Elaine. Maybe it's the red hair. It's hard to ignore. Anyway, I shouldn't really complain that stepmother is so distracted. If it wasn't for Chauncey, she might call up the school to ask how I'm doing and get told, Kiana who? The last thing I need is to get put into regular classes and have to break in eight new teachers just when I'm starting to get the hang of Mr. Kermit. Now that rivet's doing real teaching. I don't even know, or I don't even have to make things up when Dad and Step Monster ask, how's school? I have something to tell them. There are things going on in room 117, things beyond worksheets and crossword puzzles. Hang on a second, back up. My father stops me at dinner. What are these puffy tails you keep talking about? Some kind of science unit? Right, I stammer, animal anatomy. If you're going to be dissecting some poor little bunny, I don't want to hear about it, Step Monster puts in, shoveling strained bananas into Chauncey's waiting mouth. And we're going on that field trip tomorrow, remember? I move on quickly. To a rabbit laboratory. Or to a rabbit laboratory, asks Dad. No, this is different. We're going to Terranova Motors as Jake Terranova's personal guests. I don't know what we're supposed to learn there, but the class is actually pretty psyched about it. One of the downsides of being in SES 8, besides the obvious, is that you're stuck in the same room all day, so the change of scenery will do us good. Our two ch chaperones are Mr. Kermit and Ms. Fountain. Mr. Kermit has no choice, but it's really nice of Ms. Fountain to volunteer since her own classes have to have a sub today. As it turns out, they get Mrs. Landsman, a.k.a. Dawn of the Dead. Poor Vladimir. If he squeaks too loud, she'll probably gut him with a protractor and barbecue him on a rotating spit in the home and careers room. The bus is just a minibus, and it's pretty uncomfortable with the whole class packed into one side and Elaine all by herself on the other. Aldo is getting mad because Barnstorm keeps thumping the back of his seat with one of the crutches. It, does, it doesn't bother Raheem, though. He falls asleep as soon as we make the right turn out of the school driveway. Mateo stands in the aisle, knees bent, working on his balance, just like the Silver Surfer from Spider-Man. Miss Fountain seems pretty uncomfortable with the bad behavior and especially the fact that Mr. Kermit isn't saying anything, so she tries to change the subject by talking about how SCS 8 should participate in the district science fair. She's always coming up with suggestions for our class, like the good bunnies thing, or inviting us for circle time to help out with Vladimir. Sometimes Mr. Kermit lets her push him around a little, but not today. No, he says simply. I think this field trip has put him in a bad mood. It's pretty obvious that Jake Terranova isn't his favorite person. 
but it's a fantastic competition, Miss Fountain insists. Teams enter from every school in the district. There are prizes, and the first place winners get an extra 10% added to their grades on the state science assessment. It's a win-win. Not for us, Mr. Kermit replies firmly. His expression says it all. Do these really look like the kind of kids who will come in first place at anything? It bugs me a little. Not that I'm dying to get mixed up in any science fair, me being a short timer. But I'm used to Mr. Kermit sticking up for us, not writing us off. Maybe it's part of his bad mood. The other kids talk about Jake Terranova like he's some kind of superstar. As we pull up to Terranova Motors, I finally understand why. It has to be the biggest car dealership I've ever seen, and that includes L.A., where everything is kind of supersized. Mr. Kermit's ex-student owns all this? That's pretty cool, especially when Mr. Terranova himself comes out to welcome us. Hey, guys. Glad you could make it. Come on inside. Like, we're longtime friends, not random middle schoolers getting our moment with the big boss. We tour the showroom first, which, I have to admit, is pretty fun. All the vehicles are shiny, new, and top of the line. We try out every seat in every car, front and back, and third row, and even climb into the payloads of the, of the pickups. For the first time since blundering into SCS 8, I feel like I could be with any class of kids in the country, not Greenwich Middle School's dreaded unteachables. Ribbit sees it, too. His bloodshot eyes are half open, instead of the usual 25%. Or maybe he's just on the alert because Mr. Terranova is here, and this is enemy territory. Miss Fountain, the Prius driver, is looking disappoint disapprovingly at the giant SUVs and light trucks that dominate the showroom when Mr. Terranova walks up to him, her. I'm wondering if she's going to lecture him on the environment. Instead, she says, this is a wonderful thing you're doing. I don't know if you can tell, but some of these kids have special issues. You think? His grin is irresistible. My floor manager just pulled up a sleeper out of the truck of that Cadillac. That's Rahim, Miss Fountain explains. He doesn't get enough sleep at home, but he's a talented artist, sensitive and observant. They've got their quirks. They're good kids, though. Okay, maybe good is too strong a word. Gotcha. He's watching Barnstorm poking tires with his crutches. Hey, Mr. Terranova, Parker approaches. I want to take the red Mustang out for a test drive. Right. Very funny, kid. No, really. I have a license. Parker, Parker digs a mangled ID out of the pocket of his jeans. It's a provisional license, Parker, Miss Fountain reminds him gently. This is a 100% farm business, Parker promises. I just remembered I've got to swing home and pick up a load of turnips for the Safeway. Looking for a lifeline, she calls out, Mr. Kermit, I think it's time for lunch. It's hard to get a handle on what Mr. Ribbit thinks of all this. On one hand, it's obvious he can't stand his former student because of what happened in the past. On the other, that must have been forever ago. Mr. Terranova was a seventh grader, even younger than we are. He's an adult now, running a big business, and he's trying to make amends. Why can't Mr. Kermit see this? We brought bag lunches, but Mr. Terranova ordered pizza for everybody in the dealership dining room. Only Ribbit turns him down, like anything from his old nemesis would turn to poison as soon as it enters his mouth. The employees are really friendly, and we got to ask them questions. I want to know about fuel efficiency standards. Barnstorm wants to know, when do you sell a car, or when you sell a car, do you get to keep the money? Aldo asks the lease specialists. How long did it take to grow that mustache? Elaine gets into the cookie platter set aside for customer appreciation week. After lunch, we tour the service department. That's where the field trip starts to get really good. Motor vehicles are such a huge part of life, especially in a place like LA where you have to drive pretty much everywhere. People take it for granted that their cars will work, like they're powered by some kind of magic. How often do we ever take a peek under the hood at the, at the machinery that makes it happen? Mr. Terranova leads us onto a raised catwalk, and we can look down on at least a dozen vehicles 
on lifts in various stages of being taken apart and put back together again. The noise is a cacophony of revving engines, pneumatic tools, and the clang of metal on metal. The smell is a mix of oil and grease with a little bit of exhaust, whatever the ventilation fans miss. Yet, there's almost a kind of grace to it and a rhythm that's hard to resist. It feels productive, like necessary work is being done. Parker is practically drooling, and even though Aldo is leaning over the railing fascinated, it's the first time I've ever seen him interested in something, and he looks older and more mature. Mateo is babbling about how the shop reminds him of the engine room of the USS Enterprise on Star Trek. Raheem is sketching furiously on a napkin from the lunchroom. Elaine is watching in rapt attention while double-fisting stolen cookies from her jacket pockets. Suddenly, she clutches the rail in distress. For a second, I wonder if she's trying to hype her rep reputation by ripping it free from the catwalk. But no, her cheeks are pink, her eyes terrified. Sharp, staccato, choking sounds reach me over the clamor of the shop. Mr. Kermit points, pounds on her back, but to no avail. I run up behind Elaine and reach around her to perform the Heimlich maneuver, positioning my hands below the rib cage like they've told us in life-saving class back in California. Once, twice, no good. Three times, heads up, bellows a wild voice. I glance over my shoulder just in time to see a crutch hurtling toward me in a home run swing. I drop to the metal floor of the catwalk a split second before the wooden shaft would have taken my head off. It slams across Elaine's broad back and with a thud that momentarily drowns out the noisy shot, splits in two. Everybody waits for her to crumple to the catwalk, unconscious, but that's not what happened. Elaine doesn't even flinch. Instead, a chunk of cookie flying out of Instead, a chunk of cookie comes flying out of her mouth. It sails over the rails and drops into the half-disassembled motor of a vintage Corvette. The mechanics look up in horror. What was that? Mr. Terranova asks urgently. I confirm that Elaine is no longer choking. She's okay. The car dealer looks at me like I'm totally missing the point. But what did she spit in the engine? Elaine smacks her lips. I think it was a ginger snap. The word is like a panic alarm to Jake. Guys, he calls down to the team. I want that engine taken apart and every piece wiped clean. Now! I'm mystified. What's so bad about a ginger snap? Sugar, he exclaims in agony. It's the last thing you'd want in a car engine. It dissolves in the gas and ends up everywhere. If word gets out that I sold a car with a sugared tank, I'm finished in this business. Mr. Kermit is beaming from ear to ear. It's the first time we've ever seen him so happy. And what did it take? Problems for Jake Terranova. I actually feel a little guilty. I saw Elaine pocketing those cookies and kept my mouth shut. I may be a short timer, but you don't have to be at our school very long to know what Elaine rhymes with that Elaine rhymes with pain. The field trip breaks up soon after that. Mr. Terranova is focused on the Corvette, so he's not playing host anymore. Plus, Barnstorm is complaining about his mobility with one crutch. Then you shouldn't have busted the other one over Elaine's head, Aldo tells him. It was her back, not her head, Barnstorm retorts. I saved her life, man. She'd better remember that while deciding who her next victim's going to be. You just cost yourself a puffy tail buster, Mr. Kermit snaps. Barnstorm is bitter. No fair. I save a life and I'm out of crutch and a puffy tail? What kind of justice is that? He should earn a puffy tail for helping um, and lose, lose it for being mean, Parker puts in. At least then he breaks even. We should all get a puffy tail except Elaine, Aldo reasons truculently. You know, for not barfing a cookie into that Corvette? That seems to be his idea of fairness. Elaine tosses a mild glance in Eldo's direction, and he decides to stand on the other side of a tall cargo van. It's too bad that such a great field trip has to end on a down note. 
But by then, the minibus is waiting outside, so there's nothing to do but get on it. Halfway back to school, Miss Fountain gets a call on her cell phone. It's the dealership. There's a middle school boy asleep on the couch in the showroom. Mr. Kermit does a head count. It's Rahim, he reports. We have to go back and get him. And we turn around. Wait, I frown at Miss Fountain. How come they called you? I mean, why does Jake Terranova have your phone number? She blushes the color of Chauncey's diaper rash. And that's the end of chapter 18.